In 1991, the home video game market was dominated by Sega and Nintendo. Each company had their own exclusive intellectual properties that helped to set them apart and fan the flames of the console wars amongst gamers. These weren't just video game characters. They were company and genre-defining icons that were as identifiable to being exclusive to Nintendo and Sega as the logos from Coke or Pepsi. Yet, somehow between 1993 and 1994, some of Nintendo's most well-known and beloved characters ended up in fully licensed games on a CD-based console from another company. Today we're going to look at how Nintendo's rejection of their partnership with Sony, the PlayStation, and the Super Nintendo CD in favor of Philips led to a strange series of games on an almost equally strange console. This is the story of the Philips CDI and its four infamous Nintendo titles. How about a kiss for luck? You've got to be kidding. Just use your controller. Huh? In your hand, the controller. It opens up the whole interactive world of CDI. From Philips Electronics, you know, the company that invented audio cassettes, laser video discs, and compact disc technology. Development on the CDI platform began in the mid-1980s, when Philips and Sony teamed up to develop the next evolution of the compact disc format. Instead of just being limited to music or text, the new format would be able to carry programmable data that could produce graphics and video and provide an interactive experience to users. CDI, short for Compact Disc Interactive, opened the door to a number of new media uses for the medium, including creating games. 1991 saw the commercial release of the first Philips CDI player. Initially developed by both Philips and Sony, mounting conflicts resulted in them parting ways. With the current rise of the CD-ROM, multimedia was seen as the next big thing. And although at $700 the CDI was too expensive for the mass market, its arrival helped to cement the CD as a medium for entertainment beyond the computer. 1991 was also the year that Sony officially announced the standalone PlayStation at Chicago CES. The PlayStation would have a slot to play Super Nintendo cartridges as well as a CD-ROM drive that would be able to play Sony Super Discs. Sony's partnership with Nintendo also included a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo. The partnership heavily favored Sony, who would develop and retain control over the SNES CD disc format, with Nintendo ceding a large amount of control of software licensing to Sony. Nintendo didn't like the deal and they wanted out. Nintendo President Hiroshi Yamauchi secretly sent Nintendo of America President Minori Arakawa and Executive Howard Lincoln to Europe to negotiate a more favorable deal with Philips. The day after Sony announced its plans to begin work on the PlayStation, Nintendo made an announcement of its own at CES. Instead of confirming its allegiance with Sony as everyone expected, Nintendo announced it was now working with Philips to produce the Super Nintendo CD. Everyone was shocked, but none more so than Sony. Philips invents the compact disc, and music enters the digital age. Now Philips invents the compact disc interactive, and the digital age comes to video entertainment with interactive games, information, entertainment, and films, all with pure digital sound and stunning video images. Philips invents CDI, the ultimate machine for compact discs and amazing pictures. Philips invents for you. Like Apple's Pippin, the CDI was an open technology platform. Any company willing to license the CDI technology from Philips was allowed to produce a CDI player as long as their minimum specifications were met. The majority of CDI devices were produced by Philips, although there were other CDI players from Magnavox, Goldstar, LG, Grundig, and others. There were even several portable CDI systems. The CDI software library is surprisingly large, consisting of approximately 625 titles. Only 124 or so of those titles are games, and most of them aren't exactly remembered very fondly. Unlike the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo, the Philips CDI wasn't really marketed as a gaming console. At least not at first. Philips invested a ton of money into advertising the CDI through traditional print ads and even a TV infomercial, something that, as far as I know, was a first for any system. Philips marketing often sought to explain just what the CDI was and unintentionally highlighted one of the biggest problems with it, the mystery of what exactly it was supposed to be. Was it a gaming console, a replacement for the personal computer, an upgrade to the VCR? These lingering questions and the hefty $700 price tag made it a hard sell for gamers and general consumers alike. 
Since the CDI wasn't a standard gaming console, it naturally didn't come with a standard gamepad. Early models came with a multifunctional remote, the CDI thumbstick. Playing games with this remote was difficult to say the least, often making it so you'd have to stop moving in order to shoot. Other controllers like the CDI touchpad and the CDI gamepad were made available later on. The CDI also had an array of accessories available including keyboards, other gamepads, a light gun, and mice and roller controllers specifically designed for children. The CDI's edutainment, reference software, and music related titles made up the vast majority of its library. Its selection of movies were hampered by the fact that after already paying $700 for the CDI itself, you still needed to buy a digital video cartridge in order to play them. Initially, many games on the CDI were simple adaptations of board games like Battleship, Batgammon, and Connect 4. There were some exceptions. The year is 2068. Things have changed. The Millennium Wars ruined the world's cities. The Grey Tremor Plague of 2017 reduced the population by a third. Radiation from the Thanatos meltdown radically altered the gene pool. It's a mutant! Technology advanced. Bioengineers have created animal-human hybrids. Athletes are commonly enhanced with bionics. The Cybernet, a fiber optic communication network, links everything. The rage of the Cybernet is Body Slam. It really wasn't until around 1993 that lagging sales finally convinced Philips to prepare to market the CDI as a gaming console. While Nintendo eventually decided to forego a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo, their contract allowed Philips to create games using some of Nintendo's most memorable characters. Philips now had a new and clear direction for their beleaguered multimedia device. Armed with Mario, Zelda, and a cheaper $400 version of the CDI on the horizon, what could go wrong? <laughs> Nice of the princess to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Luigi? I hope she made lots of spaghetti! The CDI needed a big hit or two to really make a splash in the gaming market. Naturally, you would expect Philips to make sure that games using Nintendo's intellectual properties would either be carefully developed by their in-house studio, or at the very least, by the most experienced and adept studio they could find. Well, Philips had other ideas. They farmed out production of its Zelda games to third-party developer Animation Magic. Philips also required that all the features of the CDI were to be utilized in the game. Nintendo themselves had little involvement and offered minimal input. Three Zelda games were produced for the CDI, Link, The Faces of Evil, Zelda, The Wand of Gamelon, and Zelda's Adventure. None of these had anything to do with the original Nintendo games other than the characters and settings, but they each stood out for their cutscenes. Faces of Evil and the Wand of Gamelon were notable for their jerky animation scenes. I'm going to Gamelon to aid him. But father, what if something happens to you? I'll take the Triforce of Courage to protect me. If you don't hear from me in a month, send Link. Great! I can't wait to bomb some Dodongos! While Zelda's adventure treated players to some spectacularly awkward live-action video sequences. Congratulations, Zelda. You have prevailed. At the time, some found the full motion animation and cutscenes impressive, but that's probably because full motion video was still sort of a novelty in gaming. There were some interesting aspects to the CDI Zelda games. The Wand of Gamelon was a side scroller, and you actually get to play as Zelda but there were other strange decisions made, like Link basically being reduced to embarrassing cutscene cameos and having to hit rupees with your sword in order to collect them. The gameplay was flat, and the controls were difficult to use and unresponsive. Link, The Faces of Evil featured the same style of gameplay and cutscenes as The Wand of Gamelon, with the game's major difference being that you play as Link instead of Zelda. The Faces of Evil and The Wand of Gamelon were given the relatively low budget of approximately $600,000 and given about a year's time for development. That year was for both games, not a year each. To save time and money, both games were developed at the same time and with the same graphics engine. 
In the third game, Zelda's Adventure, you once again play as Zelda, but this time in a top-down view that's reminiscent of the first Zelda game and A Link to the Past. Unfortunately, that's where the similarities end. Zelda's Adventure suffers from long load times whenever you're changing between menus or traveling between screens, not to mention questionable voice acting. Even the live-action cutscenes are inconsistent. Sometimes they're full-motion video, and other times they're nothing more than a slideshow with voiceovers. The CDI Zelda games were produced by two different developers, but they all share similar issues with poor game controls, odd storytelling, frankly if it wasn't for the strange cutscenes, they would be largely forgettable. Although mixed the best, there were some positive reviews for The Faces of Evil and The Wand of Gamelon. Many of these reviews praised the game for using digitized sound, speech, and animation, which if you think about it, is more or less praise for the capabilities of the CDI rather than the game itself. Zelda's Adventure wasn't so lucky. It was panned by most critics for having digitized yet blurry graphics, poor voice acting, and odd bugs like sound effects and music not being able to play at the same time. There were plans for two CD Mario games, Hotel Mario and the eventually cancelled Super Mario's Wacky Worlds, which was going to be a sequel to Super Mario World from the Super Nintendo. Hotel Mario was released in 1994 and developed in-house by Philips, with arguably the most famous platformer video game license in the world in hand, Phillips put Mario and Luigi in their least exciting adventure yet. A game about making sure all of the doors in a hotel are closed. The objective of the game is to close every door in the stage before the time limit expires. Do that and you move on to the next stage where you do the same thing all over again. There are enemies and other mechanics like elevators that help make the game more interesting or challenging, but even these don't help much. Like the Zelda games, Hotel Mario also features memorable animated cutscenes. Memorable for all the wrong reasons. The game takes place in the Mushroom Kingdom, which Bowser has inexplicably turned into a hotel resort for the use of himself and his children. Mario and Luigi arrive at the Mushroom Kingdom to meet Princess Toadstool for a picnic, but find a message from Bowser instead. Bowser reveals that he has taken control over the kingdom and established seven hotels there, at one of which the princess is being held prisoner and apparently the only way to save her is by closing the hotel's doors to make sure the air conditioning doesn't get out. At its release, Hotel Mario received somewhat positive reviews when compared to the Zelda games. Electronic Gaming Monthly even called Hotel Mario's gameplay simple yet addictive. Other magazines like Wired described it as a puzzle game with no puzzles, while others questioned the quality of the animation and voice acting. Today, the CDI's Mario and Zelda games are a bit of a collector's item and have gained a cult following in the same way The Room has, but ultimately, they're not exactly thought of as good games. Say you're watching TV and this guy says... It's CDI, friends, the next generation CD player that works with your TV. And you'd say... But I have a CD player. And your mom says... No, dear. CDI works with your television. You'd probably feel pretty dumb and maybe even fake it like you'd already experienced the ultimate in games, movies, music, and more. Trust me, babe. I know about this CDI stuff. Now get into CDI, starting at $2.99 with $200 of free stuff. In September of 1994, three months after the last Nintendo CDI game, Zelda's Adventure, was released, Philips embarked on a new advertising and marketing initiative. Commercials featuring Phil Hartman of Saturday Night Live fame began airing alongside CDI's new slogan, CD for your TV, and a more competitive price of $299 was also introduced. The following month, Philips introduced the interactive movie game hybrid Burn Cycle as the CDI's packing game. You know what I hate, man? When you go to see the big gold Buddha and you pick the leaf with the virus on it. Soon the world will be divided into two groups. Infected your brain. What? Those who've experienced Burn Cycle, the ultimate cinematic adventure game. Must be one hell of a virus. And those who think the first group is just strange. Burn Cycle would go on to be held as the CDI's standout title. In 1996, Philips introduced CD Online, a system which provided the CDI with full internet access, including online shopping and support for networked multiplayer gaming on select CDI games. A forward-thinking idea for sure, but even the CDI's own official magazine didn't exactly sing its praises when they wrote, It is very much internet light. It's got the full access right now, but with only about 40% of the functionality, 
which will probably be fine for people who don't know what they're missing. Philips' $15 million advertising campaign in September of 94 would be their last major attempt to market the CDI. By 1996, Philips had already sold its gaming subsidiary, Philips Media, and in the summer of the same year, Philips announced that it would be discontinuing production of CDI systems, though titles continued to be released into 1999. The CDI was a 16-bit machine, but because it wasn't designed to be a dedicated gaming machine, it wasn't exactly up to par with the offerings from Genesis or Super Nintendo. Depending on who you talk to, the CDI sold either around 500,000 or just under a million units across all of its manufacturers during its nearly seven year span. With a lower price point and earlier attention paid to gaming, the CDI may have been able to make some inroads as a console that concentrated on full motion video games. Instead, much like Apple's Pippin, Philips was dead set on being a multimedia box that could do it all, to the point that they were more concerned about having the CDI's feature highlighted in its Nintendo games than actually making the next great Zelda or Mario game. Maybe the CDI isn't going to be looked back on as fondly as the Dreamcast or even 3DO, but it still gave us some great full motion video games as well as a glimpse into the multimedia appliance that modern consoles like the PS4 and Xbox One would become. If you like my channel and want to see more historical gaming content, I recommend checking out The Historic Nerd. If you're looking for something different but very well done, please check out Grey Army Gaming for really cool Warhammer game content. If you'd like to help my little channel grow, please consider sharing this video on Reddit and other social media. But most importantly, thank you for watching.